Setting an appropriate stocking rate is really an important aspect of range management, and if you're really good with math, it's easy. If you don't think in um, math equations very very well, then this is a little more difficult. So I'm going to try to step back, think about what do you need to know to decide how many animals you should place on the range, or, or to determine if you have enough or not enough animals on the range. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about how you set or calculate a stocking rate. Again, this is for the Integrated Rangeland Management class and workshop at the University of Idaho, and this is Karen Launchbaugh. Okay, when setting a stocking rate, you're basically doing a balancing act between supply, the amount of forage that you can use, and demand, the number of animals that you have or want to put on the land. I'm going to outline a four-step method that was basically initiated or codified by um, Jerry Holacek in New Mexico. Um, so there's a reference to this um, reading in the class, and and that this is the basic uh, process that I'm describing in this presentation. This four-step method has these four steps. First, you have to calculate your usable forage, the amount of vegetation out on the range that you can use as forage. Second, consider things that limit the accessibility of that forage by the grazing animals, such as terrain and water. Third, you have to understand the demand of the animals, how many animals you have or want to put on the land. You usually need to include wildlife in that uh, demand equation also. And then finally, calculate a stocking rate. Uh, how many animals do you have on the land at any one time and evaluate that against supply. So in this four-step method, um, it, it's kind of an academic method. It's not used very often. Um, you would use this forage demand method when you have no previous stocking information from previous years. You bought a new ranch, perhaps, and you really don't have a, a lot of good data available for what is the appropriate stocking rate. You might want to use it to estimate your current stocking relative to your carrying capacity of the land, or you would use this kind of four-step method if you were doing a land appraisal. Or you might uh, do this if you're considering a large change to your operation, such as changing the kind or class of animals. Generally, however, stocking rates are set based on experience and adjustment over time. Occasionally, you need to go back to the, the pencil and the paper and the calculator and decide if you're on track. Step one is quite simple. You just have to calculate how much forage you have avail available. So if you think about starting with the amount of production you have per acre, uh, you can get that number by clipping vegetation out on the range or using uh, ecological site descriptions which usually have long-term estimates or estimates in favorable or dry years, unfavorable years. So you can get an estimate based on your soil type or your pasture of how much biomass there is per acre. If you multiply that times the area or numbers of acres, you could get the total biomass supply that you have available. Don't forget to convert that biomass of total forage into usable forage, because not all biomass is forage, so not everything out on the range can be used as forage by the kind or class of livestock you're managing. And not all biomass should be grazed. As we've talked about previously, you need to leave some vegetation behind for soil health, for wildlife, for residual of the plant to re continue photosynthesis. So you don't want to remove all of the vegetation. That's why we apply a proper use factor to calculate the amount of usable forage. So simply take your total biomass times your proper use factor, percent that you want to remove, and you'll get a total usable forage supply. For example, for example, a manager has 1,200 acre ranch. On average, it produces 760 pounds per acre, and perhaps that was a number that was um, obtained from an ecological site guide. The ranch is located in the Inner Mountain Bunchgrass region, so research on this type, uh, according to this manager, would lead him or her to decide to remove 40% of the annual biomass. So the proper use factor in this case is 40%. So what is the usable forage supply? Get your calculator out. Get an estimate. What is the usable supply? Simple. Take your 1,200 acres times your 760 pounds per acre means you have 912,000 pounds of biomass times your 40% proper use factor and the manager has 364,800 pounds of total usable forage. 
So this is forage, not biomass. This is amount that can be eaten by animals. So that's, that's the amount you have in the cupboard. That's the amount that you have to try to work with. So that leads to step two, which is looking at where that forage is on the landscape and making some adjustments. Once you have the amount of biomass that can be t used as forage, you also need to think about if it's accessible because of slope or distance from water. Animals, most grazing animals can use slopes that are, you know, 10% or less. In the case of grazing cattle, uh, they would tend to reduce their utilization or the availability to use slopes that are 11 to 30%. In this paper by Holacek, he suggests that areas of the pasture where the slope is 11 to 30 percent, that the only 30, well, only 70 percent of the forage is available. You reduce the available by 30 percent. In really steeper slopes, 31 to 60 percent, 60 percent slope, you would reduce the available forage by 60 percent, or, or in other words, only 40 percent of it's available. And then finally, Dr. Holacek suggests that slopes over 60 percent are essentially unusable, and you, you shouldn't consider that in all of your um, calculations. Similar reductions for distance from water. Most animals, most cattle in this case, can um, access water within a mile uh, from where they're grazing. Get from a mile to two miles, you start to have a less use of that area, and then after two miles, it's, it's relatively unusable. Okay, so these are great. These are great as guidelines, but they are just guidelines. They're not rules. There are more exceptions to the rules in this case than there are rules. It depends on animal species. Um, sheep can travel way farther from water. They can use much steeper territory. Cat goats can use even steeper territory than sheep. Um, it depends on breed. Um, in the south, the Euro European breeds often can't travel as far from water because uh, they don't handle the heat as well as breeds that have some Brahma, Brahma cross breeds. Experience can make a lot of difference. We'll talk later in the class that I'm continually astounded by some animals that I see using mountain ranges, using slopes that are well above 30% without much reduction in their um, use or range. And I, it's because they, they're experienced with those t steep slopes. I don't think they know that there's any range in the world that's flat, so they're able to use steep slopes. Um, how far you can travel from, an animal can travel from water depends on the topography and the soils. Uh, animals can travel quite far from water in more level and firm level topography and firm soils. Sandy soils can make it difficult, for example, for animals to travel from water. And then finally, it depends on season. Animals will tend to use steeper slopes and higher south-facing slopes if it's cold. Uh, if there's a lot of moisture in the water, I'm sorry, if there's a lot of uh, moisture in the forage, animals can travel great distances from water. In fact, some research would indicate that in the spring, there's so much um, water in the forage that animals don't need to even go to water, go to streams. So depending on the temperature, the forage supply, how much water is in the forage, the topography, the animal species, the time of year, the time of day, all of those factors influence how accessible forage is on the range. So those um, guidelines that Holacek gives are just that. They are simple guidelines. Managers have many opportunities to break those, those guidelines. They are not rules. The third step then, once you have the forage supply and you've looked at the landscape and decided which parts of the landscape that forage is actually available and made legitimate reductions based on the species of animal that, that's being managed, then you have to calculate the forage demand of the animals. So you have to figure out what each animal is going to need to eat. In previous sections of the class, we talked about ruminants on average eating 2.5% of their body weight per day over the year. A horse is eating a little bit more, about 3% of their body weight. So depending on the type of animal, uh, you can calculate how much your herd is going to need. If you know the number of animals, how many days they're going to be on the range, and the total demand per season or year can be calculated. For example, Suppose you manage a herd of cows, the average weight is 1,200 pounds, so they're pretty big cows, and they graze the ranch for three months, or let's just say 90 days. How much dry forage do you need? How much dry matter would you expect your herd of uh, cows to graze? Let's think about what each individual animal in the herd needs. 
Well, each cow is 1,200 pounds. Uh, they eat 2.5% of their body weight, so they're eating about 30 pounds of dry matter forage each day. 30 pounds times 90 days is 12 is 2,700 uh, pounds per cow per season. If you had 55 cows, that gives you 148,500 pounds per herd for the whole herd. So it's again, simple calculation. That's just a rough ballpark estimate of how much forage you're going to need. You can also calculate forage in terms of AUMs. Uh, re recall that an animal unit month is 750 pounds. So if you knew how many uh, pounds you had, you could just divide by 750 to get AUMs of forage. Also, you can look at animal unit equivalents. That's the relationship between the number of actual animals and the number of animal units. So here's some examples of how you relate the animal unit equivalents to number of animals. If you had six bulls that were 1.35 animal unit equivalents, you would have 1.8 animal units. 270 goats at 0.15 animal unit equivalents would be 40.5 animal units. 100 elk at 0.6 AUEs would be 60 animal units. So in this case, you have 100 elk, 60 animal units. These numbers are from the National Range and Pasture Handbook. I give the the, um, the uh, web address there. That's a very ha handy guide for uh, looking at stocking rates and grazing systems and basic grazing decisions. Um, another example of how you might calculate forage demand and, and convert it to animal units. Um, if you calculate the number of animal units that you have, and then you calculate the number of animal unit months you have, you can determine um, AUMs of forage. For example, if you have 15 horses that graze for six months, you have 15 times 1.25, their animal unit equivalent, times six months equals 120, I'm sorry, 112.5 animal unit months. If you want to express that in pounds, just take that 112.5 pounds of animal unit months, that's an amount of forage, times 750 pounds, which is how many pounds is in an animal unit month, and you get 84,375 pounds of forage needed by the uh, 15 horses. The last step then is to simply calculate the stocking rate. In this case it means just uh, determining, just writing it in the right terms, writing the numbers of animals on the amount of land for the specified period in a term that could be described as a stocking rate. In this uh, slide there's three examples of stocking rates. You could have numbers of acres per AUM or AUMs per acre would both be ways to describe a stocking rate. You could even just say you have 15 cows on 35 acre pasture for four months. That's an appropriate stocking rate because it has the three elements needed. Or you have a flock of 450 ewes and their lambs on the ranch for the whole year. That is an appropriate stocking rate provided you know how big the ranch is. So that's the summary. Just keep your eye on the ball. Don't get lost in the math. All you need is to calculate the usable forage to determine how much of that forage is accessible to your herd based on the background of your herd and, and your experience and use of pastures. Uh, calculate the forage demand per animal, again based on the type and weight of animals, and then calculate the forage demand. And then, then you can compare the supply and the demand. Okay, there's one deep dark secret in all this. Uh, managing stocking rates is very difficult because the amount of forage that you have every year varies. On many ranges, it's you know the, the amount of forage can vary by two or three times depending on how much uh, precipitation you gain every year. So here's an example I'm going to show you on crested wheatgrass that was conducted by Lee Sharp, Ken Sanders, and Neil Rimby of the University of Idaho, and it's published in Rangelands. It's quite an interesting just um, story of how much variation there can be from year to year. Okay, so here is uh, repeat photography on the same pasture of crested wheatgrass. Early in the study in 1957, they had a relatively average year of 11.7 inches in grass production of 846. The next year they had roughly the same amount of precipitation, but the precipitation happened later in the year, so they had uh, half of the amount of biomass, 416 pounds of biomass. 1960 was a really dry year in this study, only 6.5 inches in, during the year, and it produced only 186 pounds of forage that year, biomass. 
Um, the most productive year in this study, or at least of these slides, is 1971, where there were 16.2 um, inches of rain, and they had over 1,000 pounds of forage that year. So think about the incredible challenge of setting a stocking rate and managing a livestock herd when you could go from 186 pounds to 1,000 pounds per acre per year. So that is the tremendous challenge, is to not get focused so much on the stocking rate because you need to find ways to be flexible because the world is not constant. How do you set a stocking rate amidst this incredible variability? It takes a lot of skill and then there's a few approaches that you can use to, to forecast or think ahead. The two main ways that we manage this long-term variability is to have either variable or flexible stocking rates or to have fixed, lower fixed stocking rates. A flexible stocking rate is where you have no more than 60% of your herd in breeding stock. The other 40% then is steers or um, young animals that you kept over or animals that you didn't cull as soon so that in a good year you try to use excessive forage by putting a few extra animals on the range, heifers, steers, young animals, etc. Or in bad years you might um, reduce how long you keep the calves on the range. You might wean early. You might um, cull more earlier, uh, cull a few uh, weeks or months earlier than normal. Uh, you might remove the bulls and um, remove them from the ranch. Any way that you can remove the demand but kind of still keep about 60% of your herd in breeding females. <clears throat> Another approach which um, many people try, it's more difficult, is to have a fixed stocking rate and that just means that you'll sustain a rate that is somewhere below the the long-term average, so about 25% below the long-term average. It means you have some assurance that when there's plenty of forage, you can graze that number of cattle and only make adjustments uh, one out of every four years or so. So some people that um, are really kind of in it for the long run and don't want to deal with changing and selling animals often will use that fixed stocking rate approach. Again, I want to remind you that this, this is, these um, procedures are, are designed for if you don't have much experience. Most stocking rates are based on past experience with adjustments based on the current situation, for example, how much rain there is this year. You might look at long-range forecasts and see uh, what the outlook for the growing season is. There might be specific financial goals that the manager has to meet uh, in any one year and so that could affect stocking rates um, over time or from year to year, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, stocking rates are really more based on the experience and flexibility of the manager than they are on the math calculation. The key is to set a stocking rate, then monitor. W with this method, you set a stocking rate. You can do it um, by trial and error or by calculations, and then monitor over year. From year to year to year, see if this if it's working. See if you're having the amount of biomass left over at the end of the year that you're wanting. Um, also, looking across the pasture to see areas that are um, heavily utilized or or have low utilization. Um, in the in in the long term, you want to have a trend where the plant composition is really being maintained healthy over time. That would be a sign of of good rangeland trend. So again. It's important to set a good stocking rate, but it's also important to monitor and see if that stocking rate is holding up. There are a few approaches that people, not, people often use to do monitoring. Um, remember that utilization varies across a pasture, so um, one approach is to, to select a few species that are indicate, indicators of the utilization of the important forage species, or to select an area, a key area. So, when selecting a species or doing uh, utilization based on a key species, you're looking for a species that indicates use associated with plants that are abundant, productive, palatable, but not ice cream plants, not ones that are highly sought, but plants that provide the bulk of forage for grazing animals. So a key species for cattle is usually some bunch grass or some uh, dominant forage grass that is common in the ecosystem. Key area is when you look at certain spots on the landscape that are indicators of utilization across the whole landscape. So they are key in that they indicate utilization across the pasture. They're not too remote from water. They're accessible by livestock.
They don't have any real topographic limitations, or at least they have limitations that are similar to the rest of the pasture. And usually a key area is a pretty small area. It's just an indicator area. So in summary, uh, use, cautious, or use caution when estimating the grazing capacity because it varies so much from year to year and there's a lot that you don't know, but, but you've got to start somewhere. You've got to make a guess. And then combine uh, utilization measurements across the landscape. Go out and look to see where animals are using the landscape and how heavily they are. Interpretations of current range conditions, so um, keep aware of what it looked like this year and last year and the year before. So knowledge of past and present stocking uh, can, rates are, are important. Uh, rangeland, you know, can it varies from year to year, and it can have heavy grazing one year as long as preceding years um, are you follow up with good management after those. It's not like um, you're going to break the boat if one year you're a little bit off on your stocking estimates. As long as you sort of have things headed in the right direction, the only way you can know if you're headed in the right direction is if you monitor. You can photo monitor. You can do. Uh, you can clip. You can um, can have somebody do that for you. We'll talk about monitoring later in the, later in the class. But it's a really important attribute. And then adjust as needed. See if it's working. See how the year looks and adjust as needed. So that's the basic four-step method uh, that we often use for setting a base stocking rate and then remember to monitor.